climate change, heat dome, or climate hysteria. Hi, I'm Michelle Sterling for Friends of Science Society, and it's July 2022. Now, last year at this time, there had been a heat dome over much of the Pacific Northwest that unfortunately caused the death of many hundreds of people, and they were mostly elderly people who were unprepared. But this morphed into something like climate change kills people. And the heat dome became kind of a, an ongoing meme about human-caused global warming. Now, is that true? That's what we're going to talk about in today's presentation. Today's presentation. So first, I'm just going to give you a bit of background off the top, and then we're going to have a look at some research that was done last year by uh, Jean Vavlit and Brigitte Vavlit Lenoy from Belgium, and they have a different theory about what caused the alleged heat dome, <clears throat> but it definitely shows that it wasn't man-made. So let's have a look at uh, the background that I've prepared here, and I'm also going to be doing a lot of reading of their material with their illustrations. So it will probably be quite a long presentation, but I hope you'll find it interesting. And you know, you can always break it up, watch 10 minutes and come back and have a coffee and watch again. So I hope you enjoy. Let's have a look. Now the heat dome hit the Pacific Northwest in June, July 2021, and hundreds of people did die. It was really a tragic situation. But it quickly morphed into an even bigger crisis as wildfires also raged across BC, and the town of Lytton burnt to the ground. And you can see here how bright, hot red it was in that area of the country, of the continent, actually. But it should be known that Lytton has a history of burning down, and here's uh, Lytton in 1892. You can see that it's in this mountainous valley with fairly high mountain peaks around, and that will be relevant to our conversation later on. <coughs> and here you can see in uh, September of 1931, Lytton also burned to the ground. Um, uh, or a big part of it did. So I think it's burnt down three or four times in past. So the question is, was it human-caused climate change that created this very hot episode? And of course we have here from CBC that extreme weather is linked to climate change. Uh, meteorologists watching extreme weather event have overwhelmingly linked its cause to climate change and a warming planet. We know this is the tip of the iceberg when it comes to heat events, Castellan said. We needed to expect this and to expect more of it. And here we have Armel Castellan. He's with um, Environment Canada. And here we have him this past week, or uh, two weeks ago, on July 3rd, a time when the uh, heat dome was still on last year. It's only 13.5 degrees and <laughs> about that many dozen millimeters of rain. So he had a soggy bike camping trip return home. Fire in July. So he's got um, his fireplace burning on July the 3rd, 2022. But in 2021, he claimed that this is the tip of the iceberg when it comes to heat events. We need to expect this and more of it. So let's quickly have a look at the IPCC's definition of climate change. And it says, uh, the IPCC, for those who don't know, that's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It's considered to be the world authority on human-caused climate change. And their definition is, climate change in IPCC usage refers to a change in the state of the climate that can be identified, for example, using statistical tests by changes in the mean and or the variability of its properties and that persists for an extended period, typically decades or longer. So climate change is a long-term variation in climate and weather patterns. It's not an extreme event. Now, also in their terminology, climate change refers to any change in climate over time 
whether due to natural variability or as a result of human activity. And interestingly, they point out here, this usage differs from that of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, that's the political body, um, where climate change refers to a change of climate that's attributed directly or indirectly to human activity that alters the composition of the global atmosphere and that is in addition to natural climate variability observed over comparable time periods. So uh, what that actually means is that people are frequently confusing climate change, which is measured in periods of 30, 50, 100 years, 1,000 years, with these extreme weather events. And if we were seeing this kind of climate change event or, or period of climate change, uh, we would be seeing these kind of heat wave periods in the same time, in the same region, over periods of time, long time. But we can see already from the very first slide that the temperature anomaly of last year, this very extreme heat wave, did not return this year. So let's go on with the presentation here. Now, so the heat dome of 2021 versus the not so hot 2022. So this was the weather forecast here. Uh, related to the heat dome over Western Canada. You can see it's a huge area. It's all in bright red. But um, here in July 1st, and this was predicted to go over the July 1st Canada Day holiday, here in July 1st in uh, my backyard in Calgary, we had temperatures that were half that. Um, so uh, looks like it's not climate change. And let's have another look here. Heat dome 2021 to pleasant summer temperatures 2022. We have Vancouver, which was at 23.8 on July the 1st. Calgary, 22. And Lytton, BC, where it reached almost 50 degrees last year, was at 23. And maybe with a high of 25. So, um, gee, what happened? So, the heat dome extreme weather event became climate change. So in the media, of course, climate change is killing us. Now, it's very tragic that so many people died, but it's not climate change. You know, we probably could have been prepared to help more people knowing that heat dome was coming. Um, but obviously, people did not prepare. And now, climate change is killing people in Canada. The Liberal Environment Minister, Stephen Guilbeault, has said that he opposes provincial governments reducing the cost of fuel by cutting gas taxes. And he claims that the heat dome event um, actually is climate change and that it killed people. But in fact, the BC Coroner's Report, uh, which just came out in June, states that during the week of the extreme heat event from June 25th to July 1st, the BC Coroner's uh, uh, Service responded to a sudden and significant increase in deaths. More than 800 deaths were in investigated by BCCS during that week, with 619 of these later identified as being heat-related. And most of the deceased were older adults with compromised health due to multiple chronic diseases, and who lived alone. So that's really a failing of public health policy and community service, isn't it? I mean, we know that there are many elderly people who live alone. We also know that elderly people have a compromised internal thermometer, if you like. It's difficult for them to know when it's too hot or too cold, almost like babies. You know, we kind of see that at both ends of the spectrum of life, that um, people lose the ability when they're older to actually evaluate how hot or cold it is, and that puts them at risk. And if they live alone, and if they're immobile or with limited mobility, say in a wheelchair, or um, if they have uh, compromised conditions, say like diabetes, which can be uh, or high blood pressure, either of these can be affected by extreme heat. You know, they really need someone to pop in and, and look in on them 
and help them and maybe move them in advance of such an event to some kind of a temporary residential center where there would be air conditioning and water and uh, a bit of supervision. So it seems to be more a failing of public health, community health and social services than actually climate change. I, I don't think that we need to spend billions of dollars on wind and solar farms uh, when we could just spend maybe a few hundred dollars and have some volunteers help these people. So we have very good weather forecasting now. We knew the heat dome was coming for quite a few days so no one was prepared and no one did anything practical which is the real problem here, isn't it? Lack of practical application of public funds. So Let's press on here. So cold is actually the real killer. Heat-related and cold-related deaths in England and Wales from 2000 to 2019 uh, show that uh, many more people die of cold. This is in uh, the UK, of course. But you can see that 23 sadly died of heat. Um, exposure and uh, 3,260 died of cold and in London 170 people died of heat related conditions and in southeast England 9,620 died of cold. Another study shows that cold weather kills 20 times as many people as hot weather and this study here gives you temperature related deaths by country and you can see that cold weather cold is the big killer and here we have another study this one is by Gasparini et al and in it they show also this is a study over 74 million deaths in 384 locations across 13 countries um, and as you can see, the extreme cold is the dark blue, the moderate cold is the lighter blue, moderate heat is sort of the pale red, and extreme heat is the very bright red. But you can see in all cases, the, ex the moderate cold kills many, many people, and the extreme cold also kills more than the extreme heat closest to heat would be here in Italy, extreme cold and extreme heat. Maybe the heat there um, killed a few more people. So, you know, really I guess we might be barking up the wrong tree if we're going to spend a fortune trying to uh, stop climate change when it's actually cold that kills people. Now here we see the world's population in 2000 by latitude. So what I'm trying to show you here is that most of the world's population live where it's warm. So being warm is something that people like, generally. And um, in the same year, BC was also hit by massive wildfires in the summer of 2021. What atmospheric conditions might have contributed to their spread, if any? And we'll find that out a bit later. And here you can see that BC Wildfire Service is saying that 42% of BC wildfires are human caused. And they issued this in uh, June 21st, 2021. And they said that the year before, 59% were human caused. So that doesn't sound much like uh, uh, global warming to me. And now, a lot of media published that global warming caused the heat dome, but science says no. And this is from Cliff Mass's blog. He's a professor of meteorology. He's an expert in Pacific Northwest weather. And this is a very comprehensive blog, but we're not going to review it today. But I offer it as another choice for you. But if not global warming, what else could have been the cause? Well, this is what we're going to talk about today. And it's something that's been around for quite a while. Um, it's a theory by Marcel LaRue. And in this commentary here, he's saying there's no global warming because there's no global climate. And he's saying that climate is regional. And this is kind of a good plain language uh, discussion of his theory. So I do recommend that people have a look at it. There's a link here. I will post the PowerPoint 
along with the video so that you can have a look at the detail. And, uh, you know, people who are more scientific will probably like to read this. The Mobile Polar High, a new concept explaining present mechanisms of meridian meridional air mass and energy exchanges and global propagation of paleoclimatic changes. Um, so that's a bit of a mouthful. But um, we'll go through what our researchers think happened in the extreme heat event. And uh, one thing I want to mention before we get into their presentation is Rossby waves because I don't know if people are aware of what they are and they do refer to it. So Rossby waves form primarily because the Earth's geography, which does two things. First, the Earth's heating from the sun is uneven due to the different shapes and sizes of the land mass called differential heating of the Earth's surface. Secondly, the air can't travel through a mountain, so it must rise up and go over or around. And that's relevant later on. There's more detail here, but you can look it up uh, online. And Rossby waves help to transfer heat from the tropics toward the poles and cold air toward the tropics, trying to return the atmosphere to balance. They also help locate the jet stream and mark out track of surface low pressure systems. So you can see here an example of five planetary wave patterns, and these patterns move as well. So another thing I'd like to introduce you to is the concept of the Fun Mountain Wind. Now Calgarians are very familiar with this. This is um, actually one of the joys of living in Calgary is that in wintertime we very frequently get this fawn effect or Chinook is what we call it. And Chinook is a native word meaning snow eater because that's literally what happens. And um, you know this isn't kind of secret science. First of all when a Chinook is coming in you see a fabulous arch in the sky and these beautiful clouds typically glazed with gold from the sun. Uh, really fantastic and a big strong warm wind comes sweeping through the city but uh, this isn't something that's um, as I said it's not secret you can go to the Marriott in downtown Calgary and right there in the lobby here's this little explanation <clears throat> Chinook winds can gain 5.5 degrees Celsius for every thousand feet of descent and can gust in excess of hurricane force radical temperature changes of as much as 30 degrees can occur in just a few hours. And every Calgarian can attest to that. So the fawn effect causes warming and drying of air on the lee side of cross mountain wind. So we'll be hearing more about that in uh, this presentation. And the presentation is called Extreme Temperatures and Fawn, Debunking the Myth of Heat Domes. This is by Jean Van Vliet and Brigitte Van Vliet Lenoy. Now they wrote this in 2021 and I wanted to do a reading of it then but um, just got tied up with other things and now it seems like the perfect time since we've had numbers of heat events. But let's go through their presentation. So I am going to read almost all of the material on the screen. I hope it's not too boring for some people. Um, I just think it might be easier for people to get a grip on this and you might be able to just listen to it as a podcast as well. So in June 2021, we had heat dome inflates over Western Canada, the harbinger of all time warmth. warmth. So they're suggesting that this is um, just the tip of the iceberg of things to come uh, and that a long duration extreme heat wave is set to crush all time records across BC. So again as I mentioned before you can see that there was advanced warning of this. 60% um, of B British Columbians do not own an air conditioner and that is problematic but um, there is a, actually a very simple way to make a personal air conditioner just so you know, you can take a bottle of water, pour out a little bit, put the lid back on, freeze it, and then you can use it as a personal air conditioner. You can place it, you know, on your pulse points. Uh, you can make a whole bunch of them and 
even sleep with them in bed and it will cool you down quite a bit so and as the water melts or as the ice melts then you can just drink the cool water so it's a personal little air conditioner it's just a little tip I give you from a time when I lived in a hot country that's what we used to do <laughs> and it works very well very cheap so the observation at the end of June 2021 of temperatures approaching 50 degrees Celsius in the Missoula Basin in British Columbia and in the American Northwest, west of the Rockies, as well as the wave of deaths and forest fires that followed, triggered a significant and justified media reaction. Once these events were over, climate activists and the media began to exploit them as part of their now habitual approach of systematic exaggeration and anxiety-provoking distortion of information. Indeed, COP26, that was the Conference of the Party's Climate Conference, uh, is approaching, which at that time it was going to be held in November and was, and the environmental lobby and renewable energies groups are keen to prepare the public to sacrifice their well-being and their standard of living on the altar of the climate for the benefits of its projects and the deals allocated to actors deemed to be virtuous. But what was it really? <clears throat> it was an anti-cyclone mobile polar in French, or mobile polar anticyclone. So, on the global thermal image of June 30th to July 9th, 2021, figure 1a, it's rather the cold that dominates. So see that? The media gave coverage to all of this heat here in the Pacific Northwest which was in fact extreme. But what else was happening in the world? Look at these cold, cold patches. This is summer. Look at these cold, cold patches. Look at them. There are lots and lots of very big cold patches in the world that went unmentioned in the press. So the media talks about the June 27th heat dome, sometimes referred to as the hot high pressure dome, but completely ignore the unusually cold temperatures shown by the full thermal image, especially on Mexico. Look at this. Now we're just looking at the North American continent. And you can see that there's this cold front that's moved right in. Um, in the American Midwest, also called Tornado Alley, it's indeed a descent of polar air, or the anticyclone mobile polar, or the mobile polar anticyclone, according to the terminology of Marcel Leroux. And that's the concept I introduced in the beginning. The high resolution image of figure B shows that the maximum thermal shift of anomalies is symmetrical in both directions with an amplitude of 15 degrees Celsius or 59 degrees Fahrenheit. America does not have the exclusivity of this phenomenon, which one meets in particular in the south of Siberia in uh, on June 20th, 2020, not mentioned at this time by the media. So figure A is a global thermal image from June 30th to July 9th, 2021 from Earth Observatory observatory of NASA and B is an image of thermal anomalies from July 28th 2021 um, Earth uh, Observatory of NASA. So what is the context of this? Well a cooling off period started around 2010 as shown by the multiple cold spells observed at the start of the year in the northern hemisphere and in recent weeks in the southern hemisphere we are currently, this is again written in 2021, we're currently at the start of a period of climatic cooling leading to a modification and increase in variability of the overall atmosphere. The winter of 2020, 2020 to 2021 was marked by massive AMP or MPA descents which led to the Texas blackout in February. People remember that? While in the same month, Belgium passed in 10 days from a cold snap of minus 8 degrees Celsius or, minus, or 17 degrees uh, Fahrenheit for a lenient week of plus 17 to 18 degrees Celsius or 62 to 64 degrees Fahrenheit. So in figure 2, 
we, uh, in A and C, we see the arrival of the MPA of the cold wave, wave speckled with squalls in A and in blue on C. In early April 2021 over Western Europe, and note the backwater storms linked to the descent of the heavy and cold MPA in B. See here? Um, the arrival of one MPA July 21, 2021 in North America, and the next one arrives in British Columbia, Earth Observatory, uh, NASA. Polar vortex disruption. So uh, that's uh, something that people haven't talked about very much, is it? The genesis of these massive MPAs, which we saw in Figure 2, is apparently linked to the reinforcement and then to the disruption of the polar vortex. This vortex is nothing other than a powerful wind circulating around the pole and constituting a dynamic barrier which holds back water, very cold air, the only source of heat present during the polar night apart from the infrared radiation of snow or ice flows, being the energy deposited in the atmosphere by the solar wind, whose particles propagate along the lines uh, of the strength of Earth's magnetic field. So reanalyzed concrete data shows that this tendency to strengthen the polar vortex is most likely the result of internally generated climate variability, and that's in a paper by Sevior from 2017. So in winter, massive MPAs are associated with cold waves. They are more frequently observed during the solar activity minima and the starting phase of solar cycles as shown by the cold wave survey carried out by the MRI of 1952-2021. And this is shown in Figure 3. Cold waves and minimum solar activity from 1950 to 1921. The blue lines, these guys here, 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 here. The blue lines denote the cold waves and their intensity determined by the MRI for Ucle. The red lines donate the years of solar minimum activity. And this shadowed line here shows the peaks and valleys of solar activity. So the researchers go on to say, we can note the series of mild winters from 2000 to 2005. Here we go, right here. And from 2014 to 2017. Again, here we can see them here. And the succession of cold waves at the beginning of cycle 24. And we see that right here. From 2009 to 2013. The past winter 20, 2020 to 2021 indicates that the current cycle 25 follows the same trend. It should be remembered that Marcel Leroux developed his theory of MPAs with the significant cooling and the significant cold waves of the years 1946 to 87. Um, figure 3 also confirms that the 1997 to 2009 period is the hottest in global warming, with the deadly heat wave of 2003 in Europe in particular. Ocean temperatures are dropping. The pack ice is returning to its normal average value, according to the uh, National Sea Ice Data Center in this season. Currently, the Atlantic is largely cooled north of Newfoundland, and again, this is written in 2021, cooled north of Newfoundland by the waters of the East Greenlandic Current, passing through the Labrador Current, drifting a significant part of the Gulf Stream to the south. Western Europe will be affected by this diversion of the Gulf Stream. And here we have, uh, oops, sorry about that, we have ocean surface temperature in A, uh, that's from August 11th, 2021. In B, we have the visualization of marine currents, also from August 11th, 2021. And we have in C, a thermal image of the Atlantic with the Gulf Stream on the 23rd of July, 2021, showing the cold, dark blue 
south. Uh, oh, sorry, cold dark blue wedge of the Labrador current pushing the Gulf Stream south. So here is that uh, cold current. And figures A and B show a similar anomaly in eastern Patagonia. In D, the current thermal anomaly, that would be late July, early August 2021. The actual data gives the um, temperature of 43 degrees Celsius in Greece despite a north wind regime, Bore, and 14.5 degrees Celsius in Brittany. This cooling is linked to a high frequency of descent of a, an AMP or MPA over the North Atlantic in relation to the instability of the jet stream, the weakening of the Gulf Stream, and the rise of the tropical depression, subtropical depression over the eastern Mediterranean, low pressure, and in southern South Italy, Greece, and Turkey. So the consequences could be significant. In summer, as in winter, the consequences could be significant. The number of storms could then increase significantly in winter, and heat waves could be more recurring in summer. For several years now, a low temperature anomaly has persisted in the middle of the North Atlantic. This observation can be correlated with the slowing of the Gulf Stream, Cesar et al. 2021, and Debor 2021. Its repulsion toward the south by the cold Labrador current, figure 4b, and its more marked descent toward subtropical latitudes. In figure 4a, this state of affairs has led to a weakening of the Gulf Stream in the order of 50 to 70 percent in recent decades, and that's again Cesar et al. 2021, but will not sign its stop due to the persistence of Coriolis forces related to the Earth's rotation. ocean temperatures are dropping. On the other hand, the thermal contrast between a warm intertropical ocean in figure 4a and a cooling Arctic generates storms, more particularly over the area of Newfoundland in figure 4c, which affect our summer in figure 4d. In any case, on the horizon of the next century, the weakening of these ocean currents will have repercussions as mentioned above but also a cooling of the climate on the North Atlantic and on the adjacent continents, we are already benefiting in 2021 from a Scandinavian summer in the Benelux, even Icelandic in Brittany, and the English Southwest with cyclonic storms in summer. This slowing down and this diversion towards North Africa of the Gulf Stream is reinforced by the reduction of the Erminger current to the southwest of Iceland, and this current normally joins the Icelandic Sea in the north during all warming episodes. Climatic as at the beginning, uh, sorry, um, climatic as at the very beginning of the Holocene. And that's from Jennings et al. 2000. As G. Miller and A. Dervernau were written in 1992, the hot episode that ends can lead to glaciation. So, a lowering of the circulation altitude of the polar jet stream. The average position of the polar jet stream changes seasonally. Its winter position tends to be at a lower altitude and lower latitude than its summer position. It has also been established that throughout the quaternary, the polar jet migrated southwards during a period of cooling and accompanied the migration in latitude of the bands of cyclonic circulation. The altitude and latitude of the polar jet are therefore climatic indicators. Thus, during the period of 1979 to 2001, the jet streams rose in altitude and moved towards the poles in the two hemispheres with a rate of two kilometers per year in the northern hemisphere. That's from Sevyar, 2017. However, the last decade has seen a strengthening of the ripple of the jet stream since 2013 to 2014. 
the amplitude of these ripples has increased, reaching on the American continent, the Arctic, and the Gulf of Mexico. Since 2020, these ripples also lead to independent vortices. See an example in Figure 9. The increase in fluctuations in the trajectory of the polar jet stream coincides with more extreme weather events over the Atlantic, such as cold waves in winter, heat waves in summer, periods of drought, forest fires, and flooding. And that's from Truett et al. 2018. The increasingly marked undulation of the polar jet can be explained by a decrease in its altitude necessarily implying a greater interaction with topographic irregularities. This drop in altitude is predicted by certain models, and there's a reference here. It's consistent with the cooling period mentioned above. So that suggests that if the jet stream is dropping in altitude, and there happens to be mountains there, things are going to bump into each other. And uh, I think we'll see some of that as we go on through the presentation. So extreme temperatures over British Columbia and the American Northwest. In the summer of 2021, high pressures are present in Western Europe, the Azores High, and along the west coast of Canada. Their maximum intensity is in June, and their most northerly position is shown in Figure 5. And there's a reference here for the source. The combination of these two systems accentuates the amplitude and intensity of the ripples of the jet stream and favors, in one direction, the northward rise of low tropical pressures, and in the other direction, the ejection of MPAs from the polar vortex. So that's the mobile polar anticyclone. And here are the thermal anomalies of minus 30 to plus 30 degrees Fahrenheit and location of high pressures at the beginning of June. We can clearly see a corridor of hot air associated with low pressure on the mountain ranges of the American West and a mass of cold air waiting on the Mackenzie Delta region in the Northwest. So that's the Mackenzie up here. So extreme temperatures over British Columbia and the American Northwest continued. British Columbia and the American Northwest experienced undoubtedly exceptional temperatures at the end of June 2021, even if high temperatures are classic for intramontane basins where the heat is normally confined by the peripheral reliefs. That's basically meaning that mountains can trap these kinds of heat events. The evolutions of these temperatures in a certain number of cities are provided in Figure 6, and the cities are marked in blue and those marked in red being located respectively to the east and west of the Canadian Rocky Mountain Range, whose summits exceed 3,000 meters especially in the basin of the Paleoglacial Lake of Missoula, limited to the northwest by the Canadian Coast Range, also culminating at more than 3,000 meters. Portland is located in a small basin of the American Coast Range. Calgary and Edmonton are east of the Rockies. So we're going to be talking about uh, this area of Canada, basically. So Vancouver, uh, Lytton and Kamloops, Calgary, and Edmonton. Uh, those were the places that were just mentioned. And uh, as you may be aware of, maybe not, there is a big mountain range that runs right here. Where's my pointer gone to? It runs right down the elbow, if you like, of Alberta. Rocky Mountain Range and runs down into uh, Colorado, way down into the States. So that's one of those physical barriers that we mentioned earlier. So Lytton. Lytton tragically suffered the heat wave and then burnt down. Um, and that's where the temperatures reached almost 50 degrees Celsius. So the maximum temperature was observed in British Columbia at Lytton, elevation of 195 meters 
but all the red towns show exceptionally high temperatures, even in Vancouver, located on the coast range, but outside the Missoula Basin. As for the blue cities, they show high temperatures, but not exceptional for a continental climate near the summer solstice at the latitude of 50 degrees north. The two families of temperature curves immediately lead to highlighting orography as a factor influencing temperatures. Orography, I think it is. Orography refers to mountainous um, geographic uh, characteristics. So what do we have here? Um, the researchers have plotted the temperatures um, and days counting from the 1st of uh, June 2021. So uh, Vancouver is the one that has the dots and dashes. Here it is. Uh, Lytton is the fully dotted one. I mean dashed one. Spokane is little dots and Spokane is in the Pacific Northwest in the United States. Edmonton, uh, sorry, let's look at another red one. Portland is the big dot, uh, the big dashes. Now where it is, right here. Kamloops is the thin red line. And then you have Calgary with a thin blue line. Edmonton with a uh, dashed blue line and Banff with a dotted blue line. So all these temperatures are compared over this month leading up to the extreme heat event and you can see that places associated with mountainous regions have an extreme profile. So this is orography as a factor influencing temperatures. And just to give people a sense of the map, um, the researchers are going to compare Calgary and Kelowna because they're pretty much on the same line. Um, and uh, so to analyze these temperatures, we will focus on the cities of Calgary and, or sorry, Calgary and Kamloops, what am I saying, Kelowna, <laughs> which are 440 kilometers away as the crow flies. Calgary is at an elevation of 1,045 meters, being representative of the Canadian continental shelf, and Kamloops elevation 345 meters from the basin from Missoula. Calgary, Kamloops, and Vancouver lie on virtually the same straight line oriented to the east-northeast at a latitude of 50 degrees north. Um, and you can see here, this is an image of Calgary, and you can see the Rocky Mountains in the background. So the, the city is very close to the mountains and directly affected by Chinooks and fun winds. So figure seven shows for these two cities a very parallel temperature evolution from June 16th. So now we're just comparing Kamloops and Calgary. Um, and June 16th is about a week after the passage of a mobile polar anticyclone, during which the temperatures in Calgary fell below 15 degrees Celsius or 59 degrees Fahrenheit. From June 16th to 20th, the temperature difference is close to 5 degrees Kelvin or Celsius, which reflects the difference in altitude between the two cities. And this is done by this mathematical calculation. From June 23rd, the temperature difference increases to reach 11 to 15 degrees Celsius. So that's really like a huge temperature gap. And so figure 7 is the comparative evolution of maximum daily temperatures recorded in Calgary and Kamloops, which is in the intramontane basin of Missoula in June 2021. So what does that have to do with anything, you may ask? Well, figure eight provides the evolution of pressures reported at sea level, measured at Calgary, Kamloops, and Vancouver, with the same horizontal scale as in previous figures. It shows a rapid drop in pressure from June 20th to 22nd, followed from June 24th by a rise with the appearance of an east-west pressure gradient, which necessarily generated an easterly wind the geostrophic effect is low over the distance of 440 kilometers. This sector wind direction is confirmed by the Kamloops readings for the last days of June. So 
you can see here barometric pressures recorded in Calgary, Kamloops, and Val Vancouver during the heat wave of June 2021. Note the very high pressure on June 27th in Calgary, 48 hours behind Kamloops and Vancouver. The thermal peak is linked to the sudden arrival of an MPA on June 27th. The green arrows corresponding to the pressure difference measured in relation to Vancouver, positive in Calgary, negative in Kamloops in the intramountainous basin. So you can see these sudden and dramatic shifts in uh, barometric pressure. And this brings us to the phone mountain wind. Such an easterly wind perpendicular to the Canadian Rocky Mountains can induce a phone type phenomenon, although the warm Chinook wind from British Columbia is known as a westerly wind. Knowing the elevations of Calgary and Kamloops and the mean altitude of passage uh, of the Canadian mountains, it's easy to calculate the temperature increase of a patch of humid air transferred by the east wind from Calgary to Kamloops. In a simplified way, the humid air, humid air is lifted and compressed by the relief, cools and condenses the humidity on the way up, then warms up on the way down, assuming that it is completely dry at the highest point. So this describes the fawn effect causes warming and drying of air on the lee side of a cross mountain wind and I mentioned the Chinook winds earlier. With a wet adiabatic gradient of 6.5 degrees Celsius per kilometer, a dry adiabatic gradient of 9.6 uh, 9.8 degrees Celsius per kilometer and an average altitude crossing the Rockies of uh, 2,300 meters, we arrive at a temperature variation of 11 degrees Celsius. So let's compare the heat dome theory versus the phone. We thus obtain a temperature increase precisely equal to that observed in figure 6 between Calgary and Kamloops. This increase is essentially caused by the application of the adiabatic gradient of 9.6 degrees Celsius per kilometer at an altitude difference of 2 kilometers. The extreme temperatures measured in the last days of June 2021 in the Missoula Basin can therefore be explained simply by a phone effect linked to the passage of air over the chain of the Canadian Rocky Mountains. So this is the heat dome theory. I apologize that the notes are in French here. But here is the fun theory, and you can see that um, this is uh, heating and drying, and this is cooling and rain. Fun and not anthropogenic global warming. In addition, such a fun regime is autocatalytic or self amplified. The very high heat west of the mountains induces a drop in pressure and therefore a demand for air over the Rocky Mountains, which further increases the temperatures in the mountains west of the Rocky Mountains. It's therefore out of the question, according to the laws of physics, to attribute the heat dome to a high pressure, as mentioned by NOAA and the majority of the media. There is therefore no need to develop the myth of the heat dome caused by anthropogenic global warming. The reality is much simpler than the sensational theories developed in the media, and the phone phenomenon has nothing to do with it. Global warming is not linked to human activities. So I, the phone phenomenon has nothing to do with it, nothing to do with global warming linked to human activities. So high pressures indirectly promote extreme temperatures. So at this stage, we have not yet identified the initiating event of the extreme temperatures of June 27, 2021. This event is the one that led to the positive difference in barometric pressure between Calgary and Kamloops, the hot pool. If one examines the evolution of pressures, west of the Rocky Mountains, over a 2,500 kilometer line from Yellowknife at 62.5 degrees north to Denver, 
which is at 39.7 degrees north, one is struck by the parallel evolution of pressures between June 20th and the first days of July, as shown in figure 10. So here we have Denver in a straight orange line here. And we have Helena, which is in Montana, in kind of a, an amber-colored yellowish line. We have Calgary in a solid blue line. We have Edmonton in a long dash line. We have Fort McMurray, which is north and east of Edmonton, in a um, dotted or sort of dashed line, blue dashed line. We have Yellowknife in a very small light blue dashed line. And we have Churchill, which is out in Manitoba in a green line. So you can see there is some something happening here. Let's see what it is. It's a Rossby wave. Such an evolution corresponds to the passage of a planetary wave or Rossby wave from Holton and Hakim 2013 with a minimum of pressure on June 22nd followed by maximum pressure in Calgary and Helena, Montana on June 27th and 28th. Maximum which was observed three days later, 1800 kilometers further west at Churchill, south of Hudson Bay. So that's quite interesting. Um, so these are the barometric pressures recorded from the north. Yellowknife is in the Northwest Territories. To the south, Denver, east of the Rocky Mountains during the heat episode of June 2021. The passage of the planetary wave is also associated with an undulation of the jet stream, which led to a succession of zones of low pressure and high pressure, which passed over British Columbia and the American Northwest at the end of June, as shown in figure 11. So this is a succession of high pressure ridge and low pressure trough zones, associated from June 23, 2021, to an undulation of the jet stream on the northwest of the American continent on the right, a situation which will lead to the heat episode end of June 2021. And that's from uh, uh, What's Up With That article. So the Mobile Polar Anticyclone, or MPA, it can be noted that the isobar maps used for the demonstration of the so-called heat dome are based on a situation prior to that of the thermal event, before the maximum pressure was established east of the Rockies by the descent of the MPA. So the scenario of this exceptional heat wave is first the gradual rise of a warm depression guided by the mountain chain systems of the American West, activated by the powerful coastal high pressure of British Columbia in position summer north. North-northwest winds to the east of this atmospheric depression in figure 11 favor the expulsion of the mass of polar cold air located along the Mackenzie Delta. An MPA which descends along the internal mountain range, the Rockies, inducing a powerful fawn attracted by the low pressures inside the Missoula Basin while exaggerating them, figure 8. So high pressures, fun, and forest fires, what do they have to do with each other? We've seen the very great influence that a zone of high pressure located east of the Rockies can have on the triggering of an autocatalytic phenomenon of fawn toward the west of these same mountains. In addition to planetary waves, the polar air masses of MPAs induce high pressures east of the Rockies. Indeed, the MPAs enter the American continent through the plain, separating the chains of the American West from Baffin Land, the equivalent of the Central American plain, further south. If some MPAs are deported toward the Bay of Hudson, the Eastern Appalachians and Atlantic, the vast majority of MPAs spread southward, guided by the relief in the north-northwest wind generated by the intramontane depression forced by the Gulf Stream. Most MPAs, therefore, follow the eastern flank of the Rocky Mountains to the Gulf of Mexico, 
This is the North American trajectory identified by LaRue in 1996. In summer, the MPAs are less powerful. The Fawn effect generated by the high pressures strongly dries the air and therefore contributes to a considerable increase in soil drought and the risk of forest fires, such as those observed in 2021 in British Columbia and in the states of Washington, Oregon, and California. So, um, so that's quite an interesting concept that uh, these drying winds, um, th this fawn effect, uh, really suck the humidity out of much of British Columbia in 2021 during that horrible summer of terrible wildfires. People suffered terribly. Um, there are other factors in BC. We've got a few things on our blog post and website about them. For instance, there is uh, an incursion of uh, the uh, pine beetle. So there's lots of dead wood. And uh, there's also a fact that there's a lot of fuel load that hasn't been cleared out. So once you have these extremely dry conditions and uh, high winds, extremely high winds, that's what really did in Lytton. The fire just swept through that community in no time flat uh, because the winds were almost, uh, well, I don't know that I can say they were gale force, but they were certainly very strong winds. So uh, that drying of the air, the sweep of the wind, and these uh, wildfires in BC were almost uncontrollable in 2021. But putting up wind and solar farms will not stop these <laughs> these kinds of wildfires, especially when we can see clearly that this is related to the um, effects of these mobile polar anticyclone uh, phenomenon. So what do we have here? The phone phenomenon is known in the Alps during cold anticyclonic periods of continental types or MPAs. In Eurasia, MPAs circulate along two trajectories identified by LaRue in 1996. For MPAs in the North Hemisphere, namely the Eastern Siberian trajectory and the Russo-Scandinavian trajectory toward the Caucasus. MPAs from Eastern Siberia migrate through Yakutia toward the Sea of Okhotsk and the Sea of Japan along the southwest flank of the Ver Verkoyangst Mountains, inducing on June 20, 2020, a very strong thermal anomaly in Yakutsk, located in an intramontane basin. In the case of the northeast of the Mediterranean basin, it is high pressures from Central Europe that trigger an autocatalytic fawn via the Carpathian chain, the Rhodopes, and the southern edge of Anatolia to cause the Greek and Turkish heat waves of the first days of August 2021, which were 43 degrees Celsius or 109.4 degrees Fahrenheit, associated with a depression over the eastern Mediterranean. Whether in Greece or Turkey, mountains of 1,000 to 2,000 meters above sea level are found to the north of the coast. A comparable situation had already occurred from May 17th to May 19th in 2020, which is in figure 12. So thermal anomalies in the eastern Mediterranean, the countries of the eastern Mediterranean basin suffered a particularly intense heat wave from May 17th to May 19th, 2020, under the effect of a powerful descent of polar air, MPA, passing over the alpine chains, in association, thanks to the undulation of the jet stream, to a powerful rise of hot and dry air depression from Africa, with exceptionally high temperatures for one month of May, amplified by the Fawn effect, and it's reproduced at the end of July and the beginning of August 2021. So, this seems to be happening all over the world. But it also seems to be entirely natural. The fawn effect on wildfire. One of the characteristics of the fawn is especially the drought downstream of the relief. In figure 9 we see that. Um, 
For a forest fire to start, a necessary condition is that of drought, the heat accentuating the latter. While forest fires can often be initiated by human intervention, as we saw in the opening, um, it's most often natural phenomena like the fawn or drought that make it possible to spread, favored by poor management of wooded areas. And this is from uh, Van Vliet Lanois, 2021. And especially during episodes of climate cooling. So that's kind of contrary to the whole notion of global warming, isn't it? And here we have a table that I'll let you peruse at your leisure from the PowerPoint. This is the interpretation using the phone of extreme temperatures and forest fires in summer 2021 in the Northern Hemisphere. So table 14 provides a summary of the factors leading to very high temperatures and forest fires in different parts of the Northern Hemisphere from June to August 2021 to trigger the autocatalytic fawn and extreme temperatures, the wind direction and the difference of altitude play, uh, oh, the wind direction and the difference of altitude play an essential role. We note in particular the extreme temperature of 46 degrees measured in Granada on August 14, 2021, despite the altitude of more than 700 meters. If brought down to sea level, it would correspond to more than 53 degrees Celsius, but the media only spoke about Cordoba. So by way of conclusion, the extreme temperatures observed in June 2021 in British Columbia and in the American Northwest can be explained quanti quantitatively and in a classic way by the vertical gradient of 9.8 uh, Kelvin per kilometer of the dry adiabatic associated with a decrease in altitude of two kilometers via an autocatalytic fawn phenomenon. The concepts of heat dome and global warming, i.e. man-made global warming, are therefore of no use in interpreting the observations. More generally, the fawn phenomenon can be triggered by the presence of high pressures in the vicinity of a mountain range. The Rocky Mountain Range is particularly prone to these phenomena from British Columbia to California, but it's far from the only one, as shown in Table 13. The hot and dry fawn wind also favors the fawn fires, the forest fires. The genesis of high pressures can result from the passage of planetary waves, but also from the passage of an AMP or MPA from the polar vortex. The latter is particularly reinforced when the solar wind or the auroral activity, which is equivalent to it, weakens, as is the case between the end of a solar cycle and the rise of the activity of the following cycle. And that's from Schlaminger, 1990. This explains why high pressures and cold waves are particularly intense at the start of the solar cycle, as already observed between 2009 and 2013, and, as expected, between 2019 and 2023. It's therefore likely that extreme phenomena and forest fires will continue and will continue over the next two to three years. So it's global cooling, Mother Nature, and not humankind. Finally, the various physical phenomena mentioned are located not in a context of warming, but in a context of global cooling that started with the 21st century, Van Vliet 2020, and that the cold spring and the rainy summer of 2021 make it particularly visible in Belgium, France, England, and Germany. In this article, a simple quantitative analysis has led us to the conclusion that extreme temperatures and forest fires are of natural origin. Man has nothing to do with it, except for the management of plant cover and ignition. It is wrong to judge a man guilty as the UN and IPCC systematically do. Daring to claim that the energy transition will improve this situation is part of an unnatural alliance between the political world, the senseless marketing of renewable energies, and environmental propaganda. That's really, that really bears repeating, doesn't it? I'm just going to say that again. <laughs> so
So daring to claim that the energy transition will improve this situation is part of an unnatural alliance between the political world, the senseless marketing of renewable energies, and environmental propaganda. So when people tell you that climate change is killing people, they're lying. They're lying to you. So I hope that you enjoyed the presentation. We've got the whole thing on our blog. It was originally published in French, en science, climat et énergie. And I'll put that link in here as well. And uh, I hope that you will, you know, consider the information provided, see how it might apply to other extreme weather events in other parts of the world, and uh, do a little research on uh, Marcel Leroux's work. Uh, sadly, I understand that he passed away in 2008, but his work remains, and uh, we can continue to study the um, impact of his findings. So again, I'd like to thank you all for joining me in this rather long uh, presentation, but um, I'll give you a little treat here at the end. When we go to the last slide, look at that glorious sky. That's a Chinook Arch. This is a Clive Chopmar picture. It's a beautiful Chinook Arch. We get to see those um, every few weeks during the winter in Calgary. And so I thank you for watching. Many thanks to Jean Van Vliet and Brigitte Van Vliet Lanoy for permission to read this on camera. And again, just a reminder, Chinook winds can gain 5.5 degrees Celsius for every 1,000 feet of descent, can gust in excess of hurricane force, and radical temperature changes of as much as 30 degrees Celsius or can occur in just a few hours. Now, you know, do you remember that um, uh, when um, Leonardo DiCaprio was filming in Alberta. <laughs> they, they had a Chinook blow in and they had to move their film production to another location because it ate all the snow. And so he said, yeah, that's global warming. But it's not. <laughs> it's not global warming. It's not man-made global warming. It's just the Chinook or the Fawn effect and the mobile polar anticyclone. So thanks very much for watching. Friends of Science Society, I'm Michelle Sterling. Bye-bye.